We like to almost start on time. <laughs> if you'll stand, we'll start. <laughs>
heaven. We praise you, Lord of earth. We lift our hands to heaven and we praise your name. You reign in glory, reign in majesty. Give him 
Cause I got rains in all the earth I got, I got rains in all the earth Praise His name, proclaim His word Give Him the glory He deserves Jesus, I need to know true love Deeper than the love found on earth Take me into
loveless yearns for you, Lord. To love you is all I can do. And you have become my soul's passion. Cause my love Let me know the kisses of your mouth. Let me feel your warm embrace. Let me smell the fragrance of your touch. Let me see your lovely face.
do love you, Lord God. And Father, we, we know, Lord, that we come before you not by anything that we have done. Our deeds are as filthy rags. It is only by your grace and only by your mercy, by the very blood of the Lamb that spilled upon that cross that has redeemed us and washed us, has made us white as snow, where we can stand as righteous, even though we don't feel righteous. <laughs> it don't matter what we feel like. It matters what we are. Amen. And we are the child of God. You call us your very own. You purchased us by your blood. So we come to you tonight, Lord God, and just wanted to thank you and praise you and Tell us, tell you, Father God, how much we love you. We know, Father, we wouldn't even know love, but that you first loved us. And so we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. And it is new every day, Lord God. Lord, we are reminded every day and in every moment that you are for us and not against us. How much you love us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, y'all uh, must be a bunch of Baptists. Look at the front row. The only one that's near me is my wife. <laughs> and staff. <laughs> and block. <laughs> staff friend. So, but see, that's the beauty of, uh, of wireless. And I can go wherever I want to. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if the cameras can film me wherever I go. But that don't matter. They can hear me. I mean, I'm going to move closer because y'all are far away. Yeah. Have somebody to pronunciate upon. <laughs> Pronunciate back. Yeah. Yeah, if you're in front of a real singer, you don't want to be too close. Yeah. The, the piano periodically has to be cleaned. There was somebody who was pulling with it one time, and, and they're like, what is all over this piano? And they go, and they're wiping it off. And I said, spit. <laughs> 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 Just pronunciating. <laughs> when I was in college, uh, we sang for a graduation in the Coliseum. And you know how reverb is in the, naturally in a Coliseum. And if you don't pronunciate your consonants, you have to overstress consonants. I mean, really, right. <laughs> that deliberate. Everybody in a choir to get those consonants to cut through the vowel sound so that they could actually understand the words that you're saying. And so we really practiced that beforehand. And... And I'm on the back row of this big college choir, and the professor's conducting, and I got to a T, and spit flew. I'm watching it, and then it about gets eye level, he's watching it. You know? <laughs> and he looks at me like, at a boy. You know? <laughs> so I'll try not to, I'll pronunciate that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been talking about prayer, and um, um, I don't know if anybody's got a leftover from last week. If you can, I, I would love to borrow it by tonight, if you can, because I think I might have uh, um, copied over my, my file on my computer. I'm not positive of that. But um, just the importance of prayer, and that prayer um, 
is how the church is to function. We're the executive branch of the church. And everything that we do flows through prayer. Yet, unfortunately, if you go to the church and you really... Uh, R.T. Kendall's the one that told me that they did a survey and that it, this was of church leaders. That they, their average prayer was four to five minutes a day of prayer time. They get so caught up in task and doing. And, you know, I can tell even for me, like yesterday, I started to look at prayer and I'm spending all my time looking at prayer. But I'm like, wow, I really haven't prayed today very much. You know, you just have to put it down and pray. And um, prayer is where the power is at. Prayer is where the action's at. Prayer is where things come to pass. That's where, that's where the, the, the windows of heaven are opened one of those scriptures that we looked at talks about Jesus. Here's Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords who we're singing to tonight, prayed. And he prayed all the time. There's one reference where he prayed all through the night. <laughs> the Son of God. And if the Son of God needs to pray all night, how much more do we need to pray and pray? So if we want to see things shaking on earth, we want to see truly as Jesus taught, you know, praying the things of heaven coming down on earth, and we have to spend time praying. And I think the title of it last week was uh, um, Time Equals Love. And uh, I even kind of, I think I included that in the newsletter, part of that on it, quantity versus quality. Because, you know, I was partly a latchkey kid in the 70s, and that was the buzzword for mamas to not feel guilty about having to go to work was, well, it's not the qu uh, quality of uh, quantity of time, but the quality, you know. And... Uh, but truth was, quick, kids don't know how to qualify that, you know, quantity versus quality. They just want quantity. It's all they understand. They, my, Gregory just wants to be with daddy. It's all he wants. doesn't matter. I mean, yesterday we went and I, I whooped him in a game of horse. And then he whooped me in a game of horse. So then we went truce. And we just bought a little old boat. So we went in the backyard and we're sitting in a boat together. You know, just doing the stupidest things together. But he just wants to be where I'm at. I mean, to imagine any time with God, it's not quality. Hello? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. He, we want to be with the Father. And so, um, and then we looked at last week that the fact that God is, he's not unwilling or he's not reluctant or he's not disinclined to answer our prayers. You know, it's not like when you, oh, Father, and you offer up a petition you know, he's like, oh, brother, all they do is ask me for this and ask me for that. No, he's told us to do that. Yeah. It's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. He says, boldly come before the throne of grace that you might find what? Help in time of need. That's petitions, folks. <laughs> That's what we're supposed to be doing. He's, he's told us to do that. And it, I believe God is excited about that process. He's waiting eagerly for us to engage in prayer because he's waiting to unfold it. He's waiting to answer it. He's waiting for us to press through in prayer. He's waiting for us to ask, to seek, and to knock, and keep on asking, keep on seeking, and keep on knocking. Now, his timing in answering prayers, we don't always understand that. Because you know what? He's the eternal God. We're not. And so he, we're going to see in a minute on these different uh, types of, of, of uh, prayers of petition that even in the examples we look at, the, the prayer had one intent, but God unfolds another. You know, he just wants us to, to pray. And he'll pray and make that thing happen, and it'll be twofold. You'll kind of get what you were praying for, but he's going to work something out of his sovereign will at the same time. So he sees the bigger picture. He sees this kingdom picture and this eternal picture. We don't always get that. We're just praying for what we see that's pressing against us, and we pray that petition, and it comes forth. And then how many times have you seen things like that? 15 years later, you look back and go, wow. You start connecting the dots of all these things. But half those things that you see God's hand on putting it together, those weren't actually, that wasn't where you wound up. It's not what you were praying for. You are praying for different things and circumstances along the way. And then he orchestrates this beautiful thing that's his kingdom will. And so we'll see that as we, we look through some of these examples. And uh, the process is his design. It's not ours. And he is inclined and waiting for the church to catch on to the power of abiding in his presence and praying without ceasing. And then uh, I think this was part of this was what I closed with last week. That we are his redeemed. We're the ones whom he created in his image and his likeness. We were created to become a part of God's community. Here's the Godhead, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. He's invited us into that. We've become heirs of the kingdom. We've come to uh, uh, join heirs with Jesus. Heirs of God. He's brought us into that community. 
We're designed to be God's governing administrative staff. We, the church, govern and administrate. And we do that through prayer. And if all that is true, and I put this last week, and it is. <laughs> it is true what I'm saying. Then make no mistake. God is waiting for your prayers to be prayed. Ian Bounds. Anybody familiar with Ian Bounds? If you want to know something about prayer, go find some books by Ian Bounds. Ian Bounds put it this way. Non-praying is lawlessness, discord, anarchy. Prayer in the moral government of God is as strong and far-reaching as the law of gravitation is in the material world. And it is as necessary as gravitation to hold things in their proper atmosphere and in life. Wow. <laughs> I might read that one more time because that's pretty deep. E.M. Bounds put it this way. Non-praying is lawlessness, discord, and anarchy. You do not want to exist in a world where the church is not praying. When the rapture occurs, whenever it does occur, and I won't get into that one, but whenever it does occur, you don't want to be here. You don't want to be present on this, on this planet. When there's not a praying church. That's why they call it tribulation. <laughs> Prayer in the moral government of God is as strong and far-reaching as the law of gravitation in the material world. Look at here. Just like that. It's as strong as that force that pulled that to the ground is prayer in the, in the kingdom of God. It is as necessary as gravitation to hold things in their proper atmosphere and in life. Now, R.T. Kendall, which I've been reading through his book, he's just less stern on, the, on, on that thought. Because if, if any of you have read Paul Bilheimer's book on Destined for the Throne, when he talks about prayer, you know, he says God does nothing outside of a praying church. Basically, the, the, though God is not, he's, he, nothing's impossible to him, but that he's limited himself to the church. And this functioning church, that His Holy Spirit is within us and moving within us. And that's what, what, what Paul Bilheimer would say. Uh, R.T. Kendall says, he says that, that God can certainly do things outside of our prayer due to His sovereignty. But then he'll turn right around and he says, but. <laughs> and he quotes even John Wesley who says God does nothing but through prayer. And uh, so he acknowledges that, that that's a possibility. It just, he sees the sovereignty of God. And I pondered that. And I wrote, sometimes I think we take for granted that there isn't a prayer behind most everything we experience. Just because you didn't pray doesn't mean that someone didn't. And I think of my life, how godless my life looked for a period of time, how prayerless my life looked for a period of time, but I know for certain two women that were praying during that period of my life, and that was my grandmother and that was my mother. And I know without a doubt there were prayers daily being ushered up on my behalf. And just because I'm living in a thing and God's sovereignty was, work, was working, I can guarantee you that there were some things that happened in my life. First of all, I should be dead, and I'm not. I should have been in jail, and I didn't. There was a lot of things that occurred during that part of my life that were sovereign, and I believe they were directly contributed to the prayers of a grandmother and a mother. And I think if they weren't praying in my life, I wouldn't have had a choice on the side of that highway that day. Handcuffs would have been on me, and I would have been thrown in jail, and my life would have taken, taken a different course. I believe that. You can't convince me differently. Um, sometimes, uh, no, I wrote that already. I know without a doubt when I messed up, I did that already. My behavior and path may have seen God. Let's impress. I did that already. Let's go to the third, the next point. Three types of prayers within an intercessory prayer. See, sometimes I get ahead of myself. Three types of prayers within intercessory prayer. Um, two of them I will say I borrowed from R.T. Kendall. So if it sounds like it's real intelligent, don't give me credit for it. <laughs> the third one, you can look at it and tell that, yeah, Greg probably made that up. Because uh, I, I didn't even look up perfunctory. <laughs> I, just, I just took his word for it and spell check didn't tell me it was wrong. <laughs> How's that? Uh, but I understand what it means. Uh, perfunctory prayer, earnest prayer, and what I made up was hybrid. <laughs> because sometimes, and we'll look in Scripture, and I think more times than not, there are things in our lives 
at least uh, as we get older in life, I think we kind of walk in a hybrid. There's some things that we've been praying for daily and daily and maybe for years, which falls more under that uh, perfunctory prayer, but, but because time is running out, time becomes of the essence and we feel pressure and frustration and, and all of a sudden we kind of move into more of an earnest intercessory prayer. And, uh, and so I, I just called that a hybrid. But uh, perfunctory prayer is prayers that we pray systematically. Uh, we create lists. We pray for those things every day. We, we may pray every day for seven years until something comes to pass. But, but those prayers come out of our spirit uh, of being committed to prayer. They may not come out of, uh, of tears or you know, of uh, being pressed and crying out to Him. They can almost come out even uh, uh, monotone. But they're still sincere prayers. They're prayers that we pray every day. And we'll get into that in a minute. Then earnest prayers are typically prayers that occur in real time. <laughs> That's what I, I call it. These are prayers that occur in the moment. We, we, something's going on and we need, we're pressed. We need to answer right now. Lord God, you know, uh, you've been in that family situations, emergency situations, whatever it may be. Crisis going on. Lord God, I need to see you move right now. You're pressed. That's, uh, that's earnest prayers. And then the hybrid, of course, is a, a combination of the two. And we'll look at that here in a minute. But for perfunctory prayer, uh, I just wrote just more of an examples. I call it prayer examples because that's really all we're doing is looking at examples of prayers. And um, there is certainly more than this if you wanted to look it up. Um, matter of fact, if you just look up praying and prayer, you know, it's amazing what all pops up just in Paul's life. But Paul was consistent in his letters to let them know, I'm praying for you all the time. I'm praying for you daily. That's more of a perfunctory prayer. In Colossians 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Now that, that sounds good when you have somebody, especially, you know, like, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but R.T. Kendall, you know, when he first came here and he said, I remember him saying that from the pulpit to Be uh, Beverly and Curry, I'm going to pray for you every day. And you know what? That man, when he says that, he does it because he's systematic about it. He takes this, this perfunctory prayer very seriously. He has a list. Then when he came back here this recently and we were talking to him about prayer, because I told him uh, that I pray for him often because uh, that book on Holy Spirit when he talks about doves. And I sit in my backyard almost daily. And, um, and we have a live oak there and a kind of a white oak over here. But that live oak, doves constantly are in that tree. And every time I hear doves in that tree, I think of R.T. Kendall in that book. And I'll pray for him. And, um, and he said, you know, I lost my list. But when I get my, I'm going to start a new list. And Greg and Linda are going to be on it. Now, you talk about encouraging to me to know that when I, each morning I'm driving to work. R.T. Kendall is praying for me today. And guess what? He's on my list, too. And it inspired me to make a list. And I sat down one evening. And I made, before I knew it, I had, I had a four-page list of things that I should be praying for every day. And, and, and it's growing. As I get to praying that list, our other things will hit me. I'll go and add that to my list. And the cool thing is, as we see praise reports, you can just add that to your list. And it'd be cool, you know, where you can just kind of uh, block out things that are being answered and go through that list and your faith be stirred up, just being, seeing answers to prayer. We saw that with Samantha. We've been praying for Samantha, and she was at a, a 50, and she needed to be at least a 70 or 75 for them to continue treatment on her uh, last week. And when they went in to test her Friday... She was a 350. And the doctor said, that can't be right. Test her again. That boosted my prayer uh, and pre my faith and my prayer life. Got me excited. And uh, um, it's not the volume of loudness or intensity that gets your prayers heard. <laughs> uh, but your sincerity, the faithfulness of heart to simply pray concerning a matter. Every night we pray for the protection of our home. Gregory and I will pray. I'll, I'll, I'll pray and I ask him to pray and we pray for our home to be hedged up, angels about us. We're not shouting in that prayer. You know, we're not getting all dramatic in that prayer, but we mean that prayer all the same. And it's a sincere prayer that God hears. That's a perfunctory prayer. That's a prayer that we do every day and every night. Um, 
Perfunctory prayers, though lacking an emotional drive or passion, may at times exhibit, exhibit the most faith because they're prayers that are prayed without fail every morning, every day, every evening, without fail. You're committed to it. Um, and if you miss it, you, you get an unsettling feeling. I can't, I've kind of gotten in a car where I can't even turn the radio on anymore because I, I've gotten where I pray so much during that time that I feel like if I turn it on, I'm taking time away from God. So I'm, you know, and there'll be times where he'll give me a release, you know, if it's the top of the hour and I want to hear the news, you know, and then I turn it back off. I'll quickly feel that in my spirit. Hey, turn it off. Let's talk. And he wants to spend time with me. Uh, perfunctory prayers require diligence, faithfulness, and discipline, all of which God is pleased with. He likes those things. Uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. What more of a faithful thing to do than to pray diligently for things every day, bringing it to Him? Um, and then a perfunctory prayer re reiterates the quote by E.M. Bounds that praying is not for the lazy. And that is true. <laughs> praying is not for the lazy. But in all of our praying, we want some certain outcome. Yet God will perform what God wants which we might not even understand until sometime later after that prayer is answered. We have something we want. God has something He wants when we come to prayer. In our prayers, there will always be the request that we want, but there will always be what God wants that might be different from our request, but God will use our prayers to release His will. He sees the bigger picture. Our prayers, though short-sighted, are used by God to release the agenda of the kingdom of heaven, even though we're short-sighted, even though we don't see it all, understand it all, he works in spite of our short-sightedness. He just wants us to pray. He's just wanting us to speak it and initiate it. He's going to teach us and show us and train us by initiating that prayer and then watching it unfold. And he's, going, he's going to grow things in us. Then there's earnest praying. And I don't know why I, um, this one came to my mind. I um, thought it was a good example of earnest praying. I always loved this, this uh, portion out of Acts 12, 6-16. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter's side and woke him up, saying, Get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands, and the angel said to him, Gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow, and he and he did not know what was being done by the angel was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. And when they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out and went along one street. And immediately the angel departed from him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. When he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that this was so. They kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. In earnest prayers, we're desperate for the outcome to manifest itself immediately. And uh, these prayers are accompanied with tears, shouts, wailing, intense raised voices, all of the above. What, your emotions can be connected to an earnest prayer, and that's perfectly fine. It doesn't make your prayers any more heard, but they can accompany that because they're earnest. They're sometimes prayed out of desperation um, or frustration, whatever it may be. Um, these are prayers that are made with desperate pleas and sometimes even with bargaining on our part. You know, sometimes out of a desperate plea, earnest prayer, you're making deals with God. Lord God, if you just get me out of this mess, blah, 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 blah. You know, you've been there before. Don't say you haven't. <laughs> Some of us more than once. Uh, but it's not that God was looking to make a deal. That was, that was how desperate we were. We were so desperate that we're willing to put some cards out on the table and make a deal to see it come to pass. So we're praying very earnestly. Our heart's desperate. And we're laying everything out. These prayers 
are life and death to us. And I think it's important to notice out of this text how much God loves us and honors our heart. Because we try to pray out a sound, faithful, uh, faithfulness and, and truth. And the very fact that uh, we, let me read that. We try to pray and sound faithful. When in truth, the very fact that we've stopped, that we're, what we're doing, have drawn attention to God, made our request for the unseen to become seen, is in fact faith enough to see it come to pass. What I'm trying to get at is that sometimes the church has a real problem of being, I call it, it's like political correctness or spiritual correctness. Like you've got to cross your T's and dot your I's a certain way for your prayers to be heard. He doesn't really care about all that. He cares about an honest heart, a desiring heart, coming and being broken before him. That's what he's concerned about. And uh, here's Peter laying in jail with the intent to, for harm to be done to him by Herod. See, they had just killed uh, James, the brother of John, by the sword. And then the Jews were pleased with that. And Herod recognized that. That's why he threw him in jail. And that's why it's said in Scripture that, uh, uh, that the Jewish people were expecting. It, he, he was in prison. So let me read it. Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod. Uh, and from all that the Jewish people were expecting, because they're probably fixing to kill him the next day, because they just killed one, and everybody was happy about it. So they've just imprisoned him. So there was not good things planned for for Peter. That's why they're all gathered at Mary's house, praying desperately for his release. This is an earnest prayer. Um, see, uh, see, Peter's situation was dire. He needed immediate release, and apparently the other disciples and followers knew it was an urgent situation. And then God, moving through the prayers of his people, puts in motion this direct, miraculous, incredible release of Peter, loosening the chains, opening up the gates. You know, Peter's just walking along in a daze. He thinks it's a vision. He has no idea until he's standing out in the street, and the angel has left, and he's alone, and he realizes, wow, God just delivered me. Not knowing even why that had happened. Because there's people praying. So then Peter goes and knocks at the door. The people answer. Here's the answer to the prayer. Knocking at the door. And they don't even believe it. You know, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. That's just Peter's angel. And Peter has to keep on knocking and keep on knocking until finally they go and open the door. And here's Peter standing here. The answer to their prayer. So again, I wrote, don't get caught up in spiritual correctness regarding how you're supposed to pray or how you're supposed to confess or how you're supposed to believe. The thing is, just pray, folks. <laughs> pray. And the only real instruction Jesus gave to us in prayer was don't pray like hypocrites. That's what he told us to, to do. Don't pray like hypocrites. He didn't give us some guidelines. This is, here's the protocol to prayers. You know, he gave us a form in the Lord's Prayer, but that's not even a rote prayer like Catholics do. That, that was a, a form of praying that he was trying to teach them. But what he really, the guidelines and the correctness of prayer is don't pray like the hypocrites do. Don't pray to be seen. Don't pray to be heard. Go in your prayer closet. What you do in secret, God will reveal openly. He'll reward openly. That's what Jesus taught about prayer. But simply get busy praying God's will and use his word to reinforce it. Pray his word. Pray tenaciously. Pray persistently, and God will hear your prayer. Now, this is what I wanted us to kind of catch. See, the followers of Jesus simply wanted Peter to be safe, for Peter to be released. That's what they were praying for. They, they knew something bad was going to happen to Peter if he was not released. So that's what they've gathered for, and they're praying for his protection. But God was wanting something else. It wasn't just the health of Peter that God let him out of, of, of that jail for. What happened prior to that text in Acts 12? Anybody know? Bible quiz? Remember when uh, uh, Peter goes into a kind of a trance? And what comes down before him? Yeah, and he sees the, uh, uh, the sheet. With, and what's that telling him to do? He's going to go minister to the Gentiles. See, that just happened prior to this. He had a mission. That's the sovereignty of God. God has a plan for Peter to go minister to the Gentiles. He's fixing to go help shake the earth and bring Jesus into the, the world of the Gentiles. And so he had got time.
for these guys to be abusing Peter and killing Peter. That's not in God's plan. And so here you've got a praying church. They don't see that. They don't know that. They have no idea that Peter's fixing to be released to go preach to the Gentiles. All they know is that Peter's in trouble. Peter's fixing to be a martyr. And we're praying on his behalf. Peter's released. They get what they want. And God gets what he wants. That's kind of how it works. <laughs> Even though their prayer, beautiful as it is, wonderful as it is, but a bit short-sighted to the big picture. And, but they'll get it. Sometime later, they'll look back and go, wow, you remember when we were praying for Peter? Man, just think, if, 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 if he hadn't been released, what would have happened? You know, God would have to raise somebody. You know, there's all these questions start running through your mind. You see the sovereign hand of God on prayer through the church. And uh, sometimes what we're praying for isn't really the total answer. But simply praying sincere prayers is an act of faith, and God always honors faith. Faith. And then there's this hybrid, perfunctory and earnest praying collide. <laughs> 1 Samuel 1, 10 through 18. Uh, this is talking about Hannah, uh, Samuel's mama. And she, Hannah, being greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord in all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come on his head. Now it came about as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli was watching her mouth as for Anna, she was speaking in her heart. So she was praying silently. She was praying to herself, even though her lips were moving. Her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was drunk. Then Eli said to her, how long will you make yourself drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah replied, no, my Lord, I am a woman. Uh, uh, I am, uh, no, my Lord, I am a woman oppressed in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink. But I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant as a worthless woman. For I have spoken until now out of my great concern and provocation. Then Eli answered and said, go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant your petition that you have asked of him. She said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate. And her face was no longer sad. Notice that Hannah's prayer wasn't even audibly spoken. It was, she was praying from her heart. But have you ever... I'm a deep thinker sometimes. I can, I, can, I can draw into myself and think so loud in my head that I think that I almost said it. Have you ever, you ever done that? You know, hope nobody heard that. <laughs> I think that's how loud she's praying this to herself. It's so loud, you know, she's not even got a clue that she's even being watched. She's so consumed in the presence of the Lord, but she's mouthing those words that are, that are sounding inside of her heart. And Eli sees her. And uh, she's praying both a prayer that, truthfully, she probably prayed every day. So it was, in some instances, particularly when she was younger, more, more of a perfunctory. Or, how do you say that word? I don't even remember. <laughs> Did I say it right? Perfunctory prayer. You know, it was on her list for many, 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 many years. Probably when she was younger, less urgent, but got more urgent as time goes by. And now as she's getting older, she's seeing time slipping by, seeing the possibilities of her having child, bearing children, slipping away. So now it's, it's perplexing. It's got her stirred. She's still praying that prayer every day, but now it's become an earnest prayer, and she's praying it. She's even making a deal with God here. Lord, if you'll just do this thing, I'll give him to you. He'll be yours. So she's got this hybrid thing going on, something that she's prayed day in, day out, day in, day out, no telling how many years. And also it's turned into something that's very desperate to her. That, that's, she's weeping and she's willing to make a deal and do whatever it takes, lay it all on the table to see it answered. Now, uh, first of all, silent prayers are heard. Okay? It's okay to pray silently um, at any time. Pray silently. God hears silent prayers. That's reassuring to me. I think that's one of the first things I saw reading the Bible through. was making a note. Wow, God hears my silent prayers. <laughs> that's good to know. This is also an example of an earnest prayer. But she's probably praying this prayer, and she's prayed it every day. But it's an earnest prayer. 
accompanied with an agreement. If you do this thing, God, then I will do this. And then it's, it's a hybrid between perfunctory and earnest praying. It was daily on her list, but with each day that it's not fulfilled, she grows older, and the likelihood that it will come to pass diminishes. Thus, she grows more desperate with each day that fails to bring the answer to a prayer, resulting in a desperate yet earnest prayer. And then we see that particular day when she lays it out on the table through this earnest prayer, Eli sees her, and he comes and he questions her, but then he blesses her. And upon him blessing her, and she didn't pray to be seen. She had no clue. She was just praying silently and her lips were moving. She wasn't praying in a hypocritical way. She wasn't, she, she wasn't trying to draw attention to herself, but Eli saw her, and he winds up blessing her. And then what she prayed for, all she wanted was a child. That's all she wanted. She just wanted to be able to give birth to a child. But what God wanted was much, much more. He was wanting to raise up a prophet. A prophet who would hear the words of this crying woman willing to be that vessel. And so here she is crying out to God. And God hears her prayer. And God works out what he wants. God works out what she wants. And what she wanted was really short-sighted. She had no idea what she was praying for and what, what she would be given and who he would become, this mighty, mighty prophet. And yet look what God does, this big picture unfolding through a faithful prayer. And then God is excited about our prayers, and that's what I'll close with. See, I do believe, I believe the and I stole this from Ian Bounds. He, this is his statement. The whole canon of Bible teaching is to display that God listens and answers prayers. That's what this whole thing is about. His bride, the church, even the Old Testament, all through it, it's prayers being answered, prayers being answered, people coming to God, people calling out to God, people encountering God. And, and then I wrote, faith Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And it is impossible to execute or appropriate your faith outside the duty of prayer. Prayer is where your faith is executed. There are consequences and outcomes that are weighed in the balance of eternity. And yet these things are determined by one moment of prayer. Some, someone's soul lies in the balance of a praying church. Someone's soul lay in the balance of a praying mama or a praying grandmother, a praying daddy. Uh, the only kinds of prayers that we are really interested—the uh, uh, only kinds of prayers that we really are interested in—are prayers that are answered. Amen. I'm not praying prayers to not be answered. I'm praying prayers to be answered. Prayers that we never give up on, that we pray without ceasing, that we hold before God day and night, are prayers executed out of a faithful heart. Prayers that we cry out before God with desperation. Longing for immediate results or prayers prayed out of a faithful heart that knows there's no one else to turn to but God. Who else would I turn to? Prayer seems that seem to be merged of both years of asking and desperation of running out of time are also prayers of faithful heart that is diligently asked, sought after, knocked upon the door of heaven, and yet out of frustration knows that God is still the only source to see dreams and requests come to pass. You keep knocking, you keep asking. Even though it's turned into an earnest prayer. That's okay. You keep asking. You keep seeking. And you keep knocking. All prayers are divinely inspired. And divinely answered by a God. Waiting for his church to pray. I believe that. Amen. Well we have just a little bit of time left to pray. <laughs> but we need to pray. If you, if you can tarry with us just for about 10 minutes. Can we just uh, in our tables where you're at. Um. Uh, Let's pray. And do we have any uh, specific needs that we need to address? Uh, uh, how's Samantha doing? There was something, wasn't there, with her? A birthday? Yes. What was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was Samantha's request. But this is so sweet. Samantha was told that that on the praise report was shared Sunday morning at church, and it tickled her so much that what happened to her was shared. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And the mom said, I pray that it built people's faith. And yeah, she said, I pray it built somebody's faith up. And I told her, told her Linda's one text her, it built mine. <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, certainly did. So let's be praying for her. Continue to pray for her. And uh, anything else specifically? You think of? Okay. Well, just share in your tables there, and in, in, uh, in about 10 minutes, I'll close this.